Oh, Father God, we are just in awe of your faithfulness. Yes. We are in awe, Lord, that you manage the seasons, God. We're in fall now, and the, the calendar matches that. We mm -hmm. are in awe at the sunrise and the sunset, Father, and the seasons and the provision, the springtime and harvest as we sang about, God. And you are faithful, Lord. You are a faithful, reliable, unfaltering, unfailing God who is worthy of our trust at every level. God, forgive us for our lack of faithfulness, our lack of faith, God, which plagues us in the 21st century, God. Help us to be men and women of faith. May we hear the Word of God and believe, Father, what we hear, regardless what the world says about it, what our own flesh says about it. Father, now as we look at the Scripture and we evaluate uh, the resurrection and the rapture, the harpazo, the imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ to glorify his beautiful bride, his pure, with his bride that is pure and without spot or without blemish, God. And that alone is a, a great and marvelous miracle, God, because we are filled with weaknesses and frailty and sins, God. And yet Jesus Christ's blood has cleansed us of all unrighteousness and will be able to present us, Jesus Christ will present us before you without spot or blemish, holy and undefiled before you, God. We can't imagine, Father, what it's going to be like, Lord. And we know it's coming very, very soon. Every believer in Jesus Christ senses, Lord, your return is near. Yes. So, God, as we anticipate your return and the glorious transformation of the body of Christ and the resurrection and, and the harpazo, we pray now, God, that you would focus our minds uh, on the things of today, God, because it hasn't happened. You haven't come yet for us. So let us focus on the realities of today and, Lord, how to uh, understand our circumstances today in light of the hope of tomorrow, the rapture and the resurrection of the body of Christ. Yes. So, God, please teach us by the power of the Holy Spirit, transform us. We leave here a little bit more like Jesus Christ because of your word and spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right, so we are continuing our series on the rapture of the church, and every time I think we're, I can see the goalposts, we're near the end of this series, it gets pushed back further. That's what's happened today. Uh, today we're talking about the rapture of the church, our mortal bodies. Our mortal bodies. We want to look, we haven't been glorified yet. I'm looking out, I don't see anyone glorified yet. I looked in the mirror this morning. I got ready. Guess what? I wasn't glorified either. The growths on my face are getting bigger. The wrinkles are more. Ooh, did anyone see that picture Janet took of me? Looked like an old. Sh on the couch, I looked like an old Sharpe right over the wrinkles. There'll be a day. The Lord tarries. There'll be a day I'll look back at that picture and say, Man, I look good there. What happened to that young man? So, <laughs> so we, we're in these mortal bodies. We're going to talk about this. And, and I, 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 this is really, without the context of the resurrection and the hope of the resurrection, this would be a really downer message. But it's not going to be a downer message. And it's going to hopefully put into context our prayer life. It's going to put into context uh, our medicine cabinet. It's going to put into context our life insurance policies. And so we're going to look at these things in the, in the reality and the light of the resurrection. So, but today we've got to read these realities. And I want to look at, I want to, I want to book in this, this, this kind of difficult message, but it's, a, it's an insightful, informative, and sobering message. Uh, I want to book in it with hope, right? So we look at Ephesians uh, 1, verse 13 and 14. This is the foundation of our message today. In Christ, in Christ, in whom you also trusted... After that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom, in Christ also, after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession, unto the praise of His glory. So I wanted to begin here with this realization. First of all, the process of our salvation. Paul says, you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Point number one, you've heard the gospel. That Jesus Christ, the Messiah, God in human flesh, Jesus Christ, 
died on the cross for your sins and mine. He was buried and He rose again the third day. You've heard that message. At some point in our journey, if you were to rewind the time, just unplay, you know, rewind the reel of our lives, and we go all the way back, we shrink down. I'm a 16-year-old boy at my dinner table and I heard the gospel and I believed. And you had your moment, your epiphany moment too, where Christ was manifest to your spirit by the Holy Ghost. The preaching of the gospel struck your ear, went into your heart, and you believed. And now you fast forward, whoo, whoo, here we all are today, worshiping right. Jesus Christ around the gospel message, the yep. centerpiece, Christ crucified, buried, and raised from the dead. This is the doctrine of Christ that we commune with together. That's what we're doing here today. So you heard the word of truth, the gospel, and what did you do? You repented of all your sins and turned from evil and started to live the narrow path and the doing good. And no, no, you believe that message. You believe the gospel. The gospel was preached, you heard the word of truth, and you believed. And what did God do the moment you believed? He sealed us with the Holy Spirit of promise. You see, the sealing of the Holy Spirit is a promise of something else that's going to come. It's called the resurrection of the body. The Holy Spirit of promise is the earnest the down payment of what God's going to do in the future. He hasn't done it yet, right? As we look at, you know, you cannot look, you cannot tell a believer in Jesus Christ by looking at their body. We're not walking around radiant, flying through the air, you know, any, it's like, oh, that, he must be a believer in Jesus Christ. Look at him fly across the sky. Or look how radiant his face is. And the, I can't stand the glory shining off of people. You, you look at people and we're, we're just like everyone else. Oh, by the way, the way you tell... Someone who is a child of God is what their confession of faith is. Amen. Your confession of faith, not your works, not your behavior. What's your confession yes. of Jesus Christ? That's what I want to hear. And we got all sorts of problems and hang-ups and issues, but our salvation isn't based on that. It's based on Jesus Christ, and we know one another. We know the brethren based on the confession of faith. The homo logeo, saying the same thing as God the Father says about the Son. And that is how we tell the spirit of truth versus the spirit of error. How we tell the spirit of God versus the spirit of Antichrist, which is a deceiver. And by the way, if you missed Sunday school this morning or this afternoon, you missed all that good meaty discussion. I want to give it up to our five star, our five star uh, pupil, Virginia. Two times five stars. That's all I've got to say. It was really good discussion though. So we were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. The word seal means stamped. We are stamped not by the Holy Spirit of God, as though He had made a stamp and then left. No, the Holy Spirit is the stamp. He is the stamp that identifies us, that private mark. You know, the Antichrist is going to mark His people very soon. It's going to be in the right hand or the forehead. Right hand or forehead. It will be the number 666, or it will be His name. Now, there's some... You know, maybe it'll be one or the other, but it will be in the right hand and in the or in the forehead of His people. You see, God has sealed us as His people. How? By the presence of the Holy Spirit. Yes. You see, after you believe, you receive the Holy Spirit of promise. You say, "Well, how do I know I have the Holy Spirit of promise?" Well, did you believe? Yes. Then guess what? You're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Why don't you just believe God's Word instead of looking inside? Do I have the Holy Spirit? I don't know if I have the Holy Spirit. Well, God just said, if you believe the Gospel, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit. So say, Amen, and start to live like it. Yeah. Praise God, I've got the Spirit of God inside of me. Okay? So, sealed, and then it's the earnest. It says that the, that the Holy Spirit is the earnest, or the down payment... And the word means uh, uh, a pledge. A pledge. It's an advance for the future transaction. I'm giving you an advance. This is a pledge. I'm going to see this through. A pledge for what? For our inheritance. Until, see we're children of God and God our Father has an inheritance for us. Okay? And so we, how do I know I'm going to receive it? Because He's given us the earnest of the Spirit of God. The down payment of the Spirit of God until when? Until the redemption of the purchased possession. You see, God's going to do a renovation on Ron Tabor. He's going to renovate. He's going to upgrade. 
Okay? Uh, flip or flop, He's going to really change the way I am. And yet, I will still be me. So when we're in heaven, uh, you'll, you'll look at me and say, that's Ron. But that's a different Ron. But it's Ron. It is Ron. But it's really improved. I won't be an entirely different face and like, you know, looking totally like, I'll be recognizable. We'll be recognizable. We are individual people. God made us special, unique, and we'll maintain that uniqueness, but we'll be glorified. God's going to do a major transformation, renovation of these bodies of flesh and blood. And the Holy Spirit is the earnest, the down payment of the inheritance uh, until when? Until we sin grievously or we, we skip so many weeks of church? or No, no. until the redemption of the purchased possession. That's how long. That's how long. Why don't we take God at His word? That's what He just said. He's the seal, the stamp, the earnest, the down payment, guaranteeing our inheritance and the redemption of the purchased possession, our bodies. Okay? Alright, so now though, with that foundation, now let's dive into the the bodies now are mortal bodies. We're still in mortal bodies. And you know what? The, I, as I read and studied for this message, it just really became so abundantly clear that our thinking is way, way, way askew when it comes to our health. It's just off. We're just, we've been influenced by the, 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 the prosperity peddlers. It seeped into our thinking. And we're Americans, right? Oh, we're Americans. That's a, as far as, you know, we, I mean, let's be honest. Thank God we live off the fat of the hog, right, in the United States of America. How many, you know what, we, we went to a restaurant last night. How many countries in this world do people have the privilege to go and say, do I want to eat prime rib? Hmm. Prime rib, what are, what are my other options? Prime rib, I don't know. Oh, look at this chicken dish. Look, this is normal for us, right? Mm -hmm. Go, there are countries in the world where they're digging through garbage cans hoping to find something to eat. Yep. So thank God for our country. I mean, we just oh, praise God for this blessed country. But, but um, my point simply uh, is, uh, I don't know what my point was. I lost my, <laughs> my train of thought. Oh, no, okay, so the prosperity peddlers, yeah. right? Okay, so we think in certain ways and we think that the health, wealth, and prosperity, and, and God did miracles uh, in the New Testament through Jesus Christ, miracles of healing. God did miracles in the past in the Old Testament. And so God will heal us too, physically. We're all going to get healed. We're all going to be cured. We're, all, we're not going to die of that cancer. We're in, in Jesus' name, we're going to rebuke that cancer, and we're going to live another hundred years. Yes. i got bad news for you. It doesn't work like that. Yeah. It does not work like that. Now, 1 Corinthians 3.16, I want to be clear. Know ye not that you are the temple of God. Now, this goes back to our verse in, first in Ephesians 1.14, that we have the stamp of the Holy Spirit, the seal, the earnest, the down payment, the pledge, the guarantee that we will be redeemed. Our bodies are going to be redeemed. He's speaking to the Corinthian church here, Paul is. He says, do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells inside of you? Now think about this. This is the Corinthian believers. Uh, they were getting drunk at the Lord's table. Uh, they were uh, pigging out at the Lord's Supper, not caring about the poor that were there and the hungry. They didn't care. They are getting drunk on the wine and eating up the food. And he's telling these people, oh, and they're fornicating. They're going up to the temple of uh, the false gods and fornicating with the temple prostitutes. And he tells them, do you not know that your body is the temple of God, that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Several observations. First of all, the Spirit of God and the temple of God, that tells us that the Holy Spirit is God. Right? Because the Holy Spirit is dwelling inside our body. Our body is the temple of God. It doesn't matter if you are uh, you were five years old when you trusted Jesus and the Spirit of God resided in you. Or if you are 85 years old, decrepit on life support, emaciated in a hospital bed, you, your, that body is the temple of the living God if you believed in Jesus Christ. Okay, so he's telling the, the, the Corinthians, do you guys not even know this? Because why? Because they were taking their body, the temple of God, and profaning it by joining it to temple prostitutes and, and doing that profane things, getting drunk and all these things. Your body is the temple of God. They're defiling the temple of God. Don't you know this? And it speaks to the ignorance of Christians, right? 
But thank God, the residing presence of the Holy Spirit is not dependent upon our knowledge, our maturity. Now, we should be mature because it transforms and blesses our lives and the lives of others. But the Spirit of God was residing in them and they didn't even know. So, so that's true of us today. We are the temple of the living God. And the Spirit of God dwells within us. Well, how do I know that? I don't, I don't feel the Holy Spirit. Well, that's because you're using the flesh to determine something spiritual. You're using the flesh. I don't smell the Holy Spirit. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've never smelled the Holy Spirit. Really don't want to smell the Holy Spirit. I don't taste Him. <laughs> well, guess what? Your smell and your taste will never sense the Holy Spirit. It's spiritual. You receive it by faith. You see the difference here? <laughs> Christianity today is all this gold dust falling. That's, that's carnality. <laughs> gold dust falling from a roof. You see it through. Wow, that's the power of God. Whoa, look at, did you see how the pastor smote that man on the head and he fell down today and was healed in Jesus' name and his leg stretched out longer than the other one. It was a miracle. I wept all day. It was so, I, the power of God was present. Did you see it? Feel it today. Oh, I put an extra 10 in the plate because of the miracle man. And that is most of Christianity in the United States. And it's embarrassing. Okay? <laughs> how about this? You are the temple of the living God. Well, how will I know? Because I, I just read the scripture to you. That's how you know. We walk by faith, not by sight. So we are the temple of God. So no matter what your position in life is right now, you look in the mirror, you say, oh, man, that's, that's terrible. <laughs> you, you, you read the health chart at the doctor's office, whoa, that was a scary report. You are the temple of God. That's why we don't have temples. There's no Christian temple. We don't go down here and build temples. Oh, yeah, verily. Oh, no, I wonder. We just built a $5 billion shopping center. And we got some pocket change for a new temple in, in Layton. <laughs> right where we need it, in Layton. <laughs> Isn't it silly? A five billion dollar shopping mall with a superdome roof, and oh, we got temples too. We got one in Layton. Forget our brothers and sisters in Chad. We're gonna build one in Layton because you know, Kaysville's too far to drive. <laughs> Folks, that's a cult. I'm mocking the cult, okay? There, it's a cult. That's right. We are the temple of God. If you believed in Jesus Christ, your body is the temple of God. Yep. Period. Okay. But now let's look at the temple. We've got some structural problems here. I want to get into those. I'm going to read through Romans 8, 16 through 30. Now, originally my, my initial sermon was going to be much, uh, much more expansive, but I realized I could not adequately cover both sides of this issue. So today... We're going to begin to simply look at our mortal body, okay? We're just going to begin to look at it, okay? And really, it was really so helpful to me, and I hope that it is, is helpful to you to put things in perspective, to be sober-minded Christians. That's what we want to be. We want to walk in the truth, right? Okay? So it says, the Spirit itself bears witness, the Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then we are heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and tra travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. Now that's what we talked about in Ephesians 
We're sealed, we're stamped until the redemption of the purchased possession. That's our body. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for it? But if we hope for that which we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Likewise, the Spirit also helps our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. For whom He did foreknow, He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom He did predestinate, them He also called. And whom He called, them He also justified. And whom He justified, them He also glorified. Now, as we look at the scripture today, and until we finish this, this portion of, of the message on our mortal bodies, I'm going to go through and I'm going to filter out the things that describe our present condition with our mortal bodies, okay? So that we leave a sober-minded about our condition and God's attitude toward our bodies, right? We want to know that uh, so we can be strong, faithful Christians. Um, so we mentioned this already, that the, our body is the temple of God. Again, regardless of the state of your body, your body is the temple of the living God. If you believed in Jesus Christ, you placed your trust in Him, then the Spirit of God has taken up residence inside your mortal body, this body of flesh. And the manifestation of that Spirit is not in speaking in tongues, is not in doing miracles. The manifestation of the Holy Spirit of God is to correctly identify Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. You know Him. Okay? That's how you know the Spirit of God is inside of you. Alright? Now, of course, I mean, that's evidence, but of course the Scripture says He is, and so we move forward in that faith. But now, let's move on to the body. The first thing that we see about our bodies is uh, that it suffers. It said, uh, Paul writes, he says, If so be that we suffer with him, with Christ, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. Point number one is, these bodies suffer. How many people have ever suffered anything? Anything. 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 Ever did. Bill hasn't suffered anything. All right, Bill. Bill, we don't talk to Bill. He hasn't suffered. <laughs> He's like, what? <laughs> I thought I just thought you were reading scripture, Bill, and, and didn't raise your hand. I didn't mean to pick on you. Yeah, I did. But anyway. Yeah, yeah. So the first thing we see is that we suffer. Now the word suffer in the Greek, this word means a, uh, to undergo hardship or pain. You see, that's really the the thing that that really gets our attention in it is pain. How many people have experienced pain? Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay, yeah. Even children, you know, uh, I was at the park the other day, and uh, this boy was helping us out. He grabbed a soccer ball for us and kind of got in the way loose. And he was helping us out, and he threw the, he got, went out of his way, got the soccer ball, threw it back to us. I thanked him, and as he's running, boom, he tripped on this ledge, uh, this, this uh, concrete curb. He tripped on it. Skinned the knee up, started crying as blood started to come well up and come up out of that wound. So even young people suffer pain. Welcome to the oh welcome to your body. Welcome to the mortal body. Pain. Pain is part of the mortal body. Okay? Suffering. Enduring hardship. Pain. Now that pain doesn't have to be physical, although we all experience physical pain. We are experienced emotional pain, oh boy. relational pain. These pains can be worse than the physical pain that we endure. Welcome to the human body. Welcome to it. Okay. Now, I, now look. This is like I'm giving you a physical exam, and I'm the doctor, and I'm coming in, and I'm like really frowning because it only gets worse from here. Okay. So that's the first thing. In this body, we suffer. We endure hardship and pain. Uh, pain, and, and, and by the way, pain, what is pain? Pain is the sensation of death. Mm. 
Pain is the sensation of death. Okay? I'm like, oh boy. Can't wait. Pain, when you get pain inside your body, it's telling you there's something wrong there. Something is falling apart. And really, ultimately, pain is a sensation when you divide something that shouldn't be divided. If I chop my arm off, my arm will die, this part will die, and pain will result. Inside the body, when a cancer develops a tumor, it is dividing this precious organ that God has designed to function, and now you're dividing it now in greater, greater chunks into non-functioning portions and functioning portions, and ultimately that division causes death of the organ and then the organism. And pain is signaling you there's something wrong. When you have decay in your tooth, it doesn't feel good. It sends a signal of pain. Right here, Doc. Oh, man, this is where it hurts. Fix it. There's death working in there, and you've got to tend to it. It's on a small scale. It hasn't killed the organism yet, but it is dying. There's death and, and infection here that's causing death to the organism. Okay, so pain is the, the sensation of death. And so imagine emotional pain. It tells you there's a rending in, in a situation. There's a tearing. It's not healthy. It's unhealthy. That's causing pain into your heart. Uh, but welcome to the human family. Okay? Uh, next, next we see the second point I want to pull out. The whole creation groans and travails in pain together until now. Now Paul wrote that back, say, 2,000 years ago. Well, guess what? Until now still applies. The whole creation groans. Let's stop there. Groans. Yep. Well, let me get the full context. It groans and travails in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also. Who? Who are, who's he talking about? Which have the first fruits of the Spirit. Listen to that again. Not only they, but we also, which have the first fruits of the Holy Spirit of God, even we ourselves groan within ourselves. The devil comes to us and says, why are you suffering? Aren't you a child of God? Has God forsaken you? Maybe you're not really a child of God. You think the Holy Spirit resides in this when you are agonizing in pain on a hospital bed? You're agonizing in pain that has not gone away and the prayers and the oil and the, and the, and the speaking in tongues has not taken that away? Maybe you're not really saved. Maybe you're under the wrath of God. Maybe God is displeased with you. No. Not true. Not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we groan within ourselves. Mm -hmm. Groan That's means good. to moan. Yep. And moaning is the sound of chronic decay and corruption. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, the person will be nameless. But a person was telling me about having to get out of the car, sitting in it a long time. This happens when you get older. You have to get out like, oh, the, the moan comes up because the pain shooting through the body. I was, I, I was uh, hanging out with, uh, with uh, uh, Rachel's son Isaiah uh, on Wednesday. And we're kicking the soccer ball around. And, 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 and I had to show him that I was, you know, I was the team <laughs> chef and chief on soccer. So I had to run up and steal the ball and run from it. And there came a point where my brain sent a signal to my thighs to, hey, let's ramp it up now, Grandpa. And I couldn't do it. I couldn't run. My legs said, no, I'm not doing that. I don't do that anymore. I couldn't chase after the ball, and this kid beat me to the ball. Now, now and then I went bowling the next day with Christian, and I started groaning. Oh, <laughs> The pain under my armpit, a muscle had been stretched and pulling. Oh, oh. I, that's why I didn't bowl so well, Christian. So, I mean, we, we laugh because we can all identify with this, right? The little kid's like, I don't know what that means. I'm always full of energy. And, <laughs> and I want some of it. But, but we, we groan and we moan. It is the sound of chronic decay and corruption, okay? This moaning in our bodies. But guess what? We are still 
Even as we moan physically and groan over pain, or, or even you know our loved ones that cause groaning, they, there's this brokenness in relationship that it causes us to groan even. And, and look, I, there are prayers sometimes where my whole prayer, and Jenna will testify to this, I'll say, Lord, I don't even know what to pray about this. I just, I just groan as this heavy burden, Lord. I just, I just can't even pray about the details of it, God. I just can't. This is a spiritual groaning in a time of prayer. And, and God hears that, right? But this is, this is welcome to the human body. This is our body. Mm -hmm. Folks, prayer is not going to change that. Prayer is not going to change it. Now, God gives us strength in prayer, and I, I want to be careful here. But let me tell you this. Prayer is not going to change this. Let's think soberly. Let's think biblically. Okay, so that's groaning. We see now also that we travail in pain. This is a description of our bodies. What does that mean? Travail is, is again, kind of like the birth pang. Sudden, brief, sharp pains. It is a physical sensation or a spasm. You ever have spa muscle spasms? Oh my gosh. So as we progress in life, guess what we're going to have more frequently? Travail in pain. We're going to have pains in our side. Pains here. Pain. Pain. You know, I shut, you know, I, honestly, I, I, one of the things, and this is very helpful for me, is because as a pastor, there is, a, and this is not a biblical burden, it is a burden I put upon myself, that when, when Pastor Ron prays, there's going to be healing. It's going to get better. And you know what I found? If you think you're going to call me and get a miracle healing, you might as well call somebody else. You might as well call the bartender down the street. <laughs> okay? He will give you more physical relief than my prayer will, potentially. Now, I'm not saying don't pray for these things. I'm saying, though, it is the exception, not the rule, that our bodies are, wow, Pastor said that magic prayer, and now I have full, that pain just disappeared. How many people have seen the movie uh, about Jeremy Camp? I still uh, believe. Yeah. Oh, okay. Didn't they pray for his wife? Yes. No. Yeah. Did she die? Yeah. yeah. She did die. Okay. When we receive physical healing, what, and the Lord just showed this to me, like, Lord, it was so obvious, why didn't I see that? You know, you would think, it's one thing, to, oh, Pastor Ron's going to pray for me and I got better, but if Jesus were physically here, here's Pastor Ron, and here's Jesus Christ Himself, and I'm standing here, people want to come up for prayer, and there's Jesus, uh, what line do you think is going to be longer for miracle healings and prayer? It's going to be Jesus. I'm going to be standing here tapping my toes and watching Jesus do the, one, the miracle work. All right. But do you know that every single person to a T that Jesus healed physically died? Yeah. Their healing was temporary. Mm -hmm. Temporary healing. Even Lazarus was raised from the dead only to die again. So folks, if you're banking on prolonging and, and I'm investing in this whole body, I'm telling you right now, you're going in the wrong direction. We need to be sober-minded about these bodies. Okay? So travailing in pain. How about now? Infirmities. That's our next one. That the, the Spirit helps our infirmities. Of course, that means we are, have infirmities. The word infirmity means frailty, feebleness. Frail and feeble. I just mentioned me trying to run and keep up with a 12-year-old. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm feeble. I can't. And boy, you want to talk about... Sucking in air. If you felt that strong wind, it was me trying to draw air in my lungs <laughs> after I ran five paces at full speed. And I don't tell Isaiah this because I'm still going to, you know, let, it, let him think that I, I'm in charge. <laughs> As I looked up the word infirmity in, throughout the New Testament, I came up with several different illustrations or, or uses of the word. It was used for disease. It was used of a physical condition. Mm -hmm. It was used of weakness of the flesh in regard to our understanding uh, of the things of God and our own righteousness, right? We, we're infirm people. We don't have it all together. We don't have a sterling resume that John MacArthur can look at and say, by golly, that's the same person. 
Okay? We don't have that. We're filled with infirmity and weaknesses. Um, diseases, etc. Temptation unto sin was used, the word infirmity was used. Temptation to sin, yielding to sin, infirmities. Thank God the Spirit of God helps our infirmities. He's interceding for us constantly. He doesn't forsake us. We're still the temple of God. The Holy Spirit of God still resides in us. But even so, we have infirmities. Now if you move forward now as we're looking at the body, still the, the, this mortal body, 1 Corinthians 15, 42-44 gives us more descriptors. So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body, it is sown in corruption. Now we see this word, it describes our body. Corruption. The word means to decay or dissolve. You know, my left knee, I've noticed since this year, it pops now every time I move it. It pops. It didn't used to do that. Um, I had surgery on it years ago to repair the other ACL, and everything was still fine. I could play sports and everything, but now it pops, right? It, everything is dissolving. The, the bond of this body, these things are breaking down, and it's getting looser and, and loose, more and more loose and, and dissolving. It's corrupt. This body is corrupt. Okay? It's decaying. It's dissolving. Uh, we read that the, the current body is sown in dishonor, and it will be raised in glory. Now, we're sown in corruption. That's what we are right now. It's going to be raised in incorruption. Thank God there's not going to be any dissolution or dissolving or decay. Now, you think about decay, think again about a tooth, how a tooth will just rot from the inside. And then one time I had a decayed tooth, and I just bit down on a sweet sugar cookie, a soft sugar cookie. Uh -huh. I bit down on it, and that tooth uh -huh. crumbled because it had decayed yep. to yep. such a point. Well, that's what our bodies are doing. They're decaying. Uh, because of the corruption. And now we see uh, it is sown in dishonor. The word dishonor means shame or vile. And we did kind of have a chuckle last week about this. We talked about it. Uh, but I'm going to draw it a little bit more. Um, our bodies cause embarrassment. Our bodies cause embarrassment. That's what I mentioned before. I When I go swimming, I put on a shirt no matter where I am because I'm embarrassed by my body, the way it appears, right? Uh, women are, are embarrassed of certain photographs. Well, let's just say most pho photographs. <laughs> uh, to the broad brush here, but... Uh, Careful on the elaboration. <laughs> Rain it in. Thank you, Bill, for that point. Uh, moving right along. Um, but notice the shame in our appearance, in dysfunction, disfigurement. There's shame in this mortal body. Mm -hmm. There are some people, you know, you, th you think about certain situations where you had to look away. You know, you, didn't wanna, you don't want to stare at someone's disfigurement or something. Mm -hmm. um, our, these bodies have shame built into them. You know, when we're ultimately at the, at the end of our lives, and, and I, you know, I, I think about my grandmother who was, was very frail, very weak in her 90s, and and her son was taking care of her, and he talked to me about her final days and how he had to take her in. He would carry his own mother in and put her in a tub and bathe her body. Mm -hmm. Just her old, emaciated, frail body. Mm -hmm. You know what? My grandmother is a believer in Jesus Christ. The Spirit of God was in that emaciated old body. When her spirit departed out, she went into glory. She's in heaven. She's going to have a glorified body. And she doesn't worry about that pain anymore. Nope. But I'm just saying, these bodies are shame, filled with shame. You know, I wouldn't dare want anyone to look at my body and bathe it. And yet there, she was at the point of weakness that she had to do that. Okay? And, and may we be as loving as, as, as my uncle was to take care of one another, even though it's not pleasant at time of suffering and shame. These are our bodies, folks. Did I tell you that prayer won't change that? Nope. Prayer won't change that. Okay. Uh, dishonor, weakness, we already covered that. Uh, it's a natural body. It's sown in weakness. It's raised in power. It's sown a natural body. It's raised a spiritual body. Well, what's the natural body we have right now? Well, the word natural is the word sukikos. It's where the word that comes, soul comes from that. 
Uh, the natural body, and what does that mean? It means it is, it's sensitive. It is sensual. Our body is sensual. Now, that's not just in a sexual sense. Our body is governed by the senses. Mm -hmm. Oh, somebody making cookies? <laughs> I'm hungry, I want to eat. My tummy hurts, and so therefore my body yields. I'm going to go eat something. Look at those pretty fireworks. Oh, pretty, pretty. I'm going to go looky, looky at the fireworks. Um, you look at, uh, in Philippians, Paul, Paul speaks of those who are the dogs. He says, whose God is their belly. Now really, what he's saying is their appetites, their bodily appetites governs their lifestyle. You see someone enslaved, uh, an unbeliever who is enslaved to sensual, sexual promiscuity. And you see these vile, filthy bumper stickers that are on their car. It says a lot. There's a lot to be said about a bumper sticker a man will, or woman will put on their vehicle. And they're glorying in their own shame. They don't even realize that some of these bumper stickers, they glory in their shame. So it's a sensual body, and if we, and, and as believers, it is very possible even for a believer to yield himself or herself to the appetites of the body. That is the definition of a carnal Christian, a Christian whose life is governed by fleshly cravings and appetites. Uh, I've shared this before, where you know, oh, I'm tired. I, I was telling Janet just the other night, last night. I was, or Friday night, I'm like, I just can't get motivated to do anything. I was just, I was just tired physically, and I just wanted to plop in front of the TV, and I, and I did for a little bit. I, I yielded and plopped, and, uh, and 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 my. But if I yielded to my flesh consistently, you know, it'd be like, I wouldn't prepare anything. I would just, you know, I would, I'd be at a football game somewhere, you know. Um, I don't know if you know, I really like football, but. But the, the natural body is that way, and we shouldn't be surprised when the world pursues the cravings of this sensual body. But now God's going to replace our, our soulish body with a spiritual body. A body that is in harmony with the Spirit of God, that craves the things of the Spirit of God 100% of the time. Yes. That's going to happen, folks. It's called the resurrection, the rapture of the church, the glorification of the body. But right now, our bodies are working against us in the sense that they are the, the residents of sin. We still have sin in the flesh. That's the problem. There's sin in the members of our body. It's not that our body itself is evil, but it is now the home of sin. It's, sin has been now exiled exclusively to the flesh. Uh, after we were born again, we were cleansed spiritually. Um, a natural body is a flesh and blood body. A flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. See, these bodies are not fit for the kingdom of God. We need a new body that's fit for a new kingdom. Okay? And, and this corruptible cannot inherit incorruption. You cannot give something that is incorruptible that does not dissolve or decay to a creature that is in a state of decay. And even in the Messianic kingdom, there will be death and decay. It will be greatly restricted. And death will not finally be ultimately destroyed until Jesus Christ hands over the kingdom to God. And then death is forever abolished. There will be no more decay, no more death, no more sorrow. Now for us, of course, that's going to begin at the resurrection when we have a glorified body. But I mean for all the creature, when God creates a new heaven and a new earth, in that, from that point eternally forward, righteousness dwells there. And there will be no more decay. But flesh and blood cannot, you can't put that square peg in the round of, of corruption into the round hole of eternal incorruption. We have to be changed. But our body right now, it's a natural body, it's a flesh and blood body. What did Jesus Christ say about his body? His is not a flesh and blood body, it is a flesh and bone. Flesh and bone body. No blood in the, in the glorified body. Flesh and bone. Okay? Blood is for this mortal. It's the life of the flesh. But in a glorified body, what's the life of our flesh? Jesus Christ. He's the life of our flesh. We don't need blood coursing through our bodies at that point. Now, so that means there was a physiologic, physical change in him while he was here on earth? Yes, he, because he had flesh and blood. 
and his, and his body was made by God. Yeah. A human body was made by God to be the sacrifice. That's why the, the, the eternal logos of God had to become flesh. Because he had to have flesh to be the sacrifice for sins. And, and of course he was a perfect human being. There was nothing different about him in the sense of his humanity. Uh, except that he was holy. Perfectly holy. And so when his body was broken open, his blood was shed forth as the price, the atoning price, was the payment in his lifeblood. But in his glorified body, there's no blood coursing through that body. It's flesh okay. and bone. Well, obviously, that was after the cross. Yeah, yeah it, was, it was after the resurrection. Yeah. Because that's when, yeah, pile that's of when blood Jesus... Had a pile of water. Say again? So he had a pile of blood and he had a pile of water, remember? Well, that was when he was crucified. They put the spear in his side and blood and water poured out of his body. Right, so... That was the, the payment for our sins. So that's what, that's what I'm Remember, every minute of digression is a minute extra in the sermon. So, <laughs> <laughs> so if we want to pursue this, well, I'll tell you what, let's, let's table it until after the message is, is done. Well, nobody's going to fall three stories right, and, die, and die listening to you for... You might fall and knock a tooth out. That but, but that's not falling three stories right. and dying. That's why we, because, because I do have the power of sleep when I preach, I've noticed, that's why we'll never have a two story facility. <laughs> oh, man. Okay, anyway. anyway um, so, flesh and blood. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, the life of the flesh is in the blood t today, but in eternity, our flesh, uh, again, our spirit derives its life from Jesus Christ, and our flesh, our body, will derive its life from Jesus Christ. We're never independent of Christ. He is the life of our spirit, and He is the, will be the life of our flesh after we are, our bodies are redeemed, or, or uh, extreme uh, body makeover. Okay, um... Notice this now. Um, James 4.14 tells us about the brevity of life. Whereas, uh, whereas you know, excuse me, whereas ye know not, you know not what shall be tomorrow. For, for what is your life? What is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanishes away. So we draw from this about our flesh and blood natural life is, first of all, it is a vapor. It is a, a mist. And it appears for a little time. Boy, the older you get, you realize how short life is, right? Mm -hmm. When you're young, oh, life is forever. And then you realize, whoa, how did I become 54 years old? <laughs> How did I get to be? Wait a minute, I was just 20, and then we were in Germany eating crepes and, and, and having fun, and, and now I'm 54. It's very brief, life is. It appears for a little while, and then, then it says it vanishes away. Oh. To vanish away, to render unapparent, to disappear. I remember having this very depressing thought years ago we have beautiful pictures of our grandchildren we post them on Facebook we've got all these great pictures and we delight in them but the thought occurred to me do you know there's going to be a time when some human being will pick that picture up and not know who that is and not care who that is and no one will know who that is who's this? I don't know we're all going to have something written on it <laughs> Even then they won't know who that is. <laughs> I was thinking about my neighbor who, who, who died just a few weeks ago. And how it grieves me. And, this, and his wife doesn't even know this. I mean, And I was thinking, how many other neighbors are this way? I look over at his yard and he always kept a beautiful yard. He's a great guy, very friendly. Mm -hmm. And now that yard is unkept because mm -hmm. someone else is coming to mow it for her. Um, and I miss him. He's disappeared. I don't see him anymore. He's not out. Where is he? I don't see him. Because he's gone. He's disappeared. His, his vapor has evaporated. The mist is gone. That was once my neighbor whom I talked to. He's disappeared. You know, one day we're going to disappear. If the Lord tarries, we're going to disappear. 
No one's going to remember. Who was a pastor of Grace Bible Ministries? I don't know. I'm sure they won't even be asking those questions by then. Exactly. No, I'm, no, I'm just giving this as an example. You know, we think, oh, yeah, well, it's me. Well, you're going to disappear. Like, what was Grace Bible yeah. Ministries? <laughs> what was the church? Yeah, yeah that's a good but my point is, is that, that we're going to vanish away, we're going to disappear, be forgotten. Yep. Folks, your, all your prayer life can't change that. Cannot change it. Then we end, of course, in death. Uh, with a body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So this simply tells us uh, that the body... Uh, I did set my timer, I know I did. <laughs> start. <laughs> so that's why, that's why we're going to finish today. Um, when the spirit, when the spirit, when this, when this temple is no longer a fit vessel for the human spirit, our spirit separates out. And again, separation is the essence of death. When the spirit separates out from the flesh, the body falls into the ground. Okay, um, our separation from God in the garden through the fall is what is what brought death into the, all, the whole human family. Okay, and so. Um, the spirit leaves the body, the body is dead. The body without the spirit is dead. Okay? Um, Genesis 3.19, this is the final verse of this message. After the fall of man, after Adam sinned, God is now confronting Adam and Eve and the serpent. And he speaks to Adam and he says, In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread until... Thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. This is the end state of this body prior to the rapture of the church. Dust. These bodies will decay into dust. Now, I talked about this a little bit last week, I believe. When I was talking about Adam, if you could find Adam, if you knew where Adam's grave marker was, and you were to dig into the earth, you would find nothing because his whole body is now into dust. Uh, having been, actually, actually, I take that back. I was going to say he's been dead the longest physically, but that's not true. His son Abel has been dead the longest. <coughs> and he was killed by Cain. My point here simply is I wanted to put in context our bodies right now. And the important thing is. Number one, that we're sober-minded about this. Okay? We're sober-minded about it. And number two, we were able to put things into context. Okay? And so, what's my conclusion? This is the normal state of affairs in this life. Okay? It is, these things are not a measure of God's love or presence with you. This is the number one takeaway. Do not let the devil say, God is forsaking you because of your sin, X, Y, and Z. You know it. That's why he's doing it. You know it. And you'll start to believe it, and you'll be swallowed up in sorrow and depression. You see, the way we're delivered from this is by hope. And we have a living hope. We're going to be raised from the dead. Okay? The devil through the death card, and Jesus Christ through the resurrection card. See, he trumps death. He trumps the mortal body. The spiritual body is greater than the mortal body. And resurrection life is greater than satanic death. Sin and death. Okay? Now this also is something very important as I thought this through and I've already kind of teased you with it. All physical healing is temporary. Mm -hmm. If I anoint you with oil and say a prayer and God in His sovereignty says, yes, I will honor that prayer and bring healing to this specific issue, you will still mark your calendar. You still have a date with death. Yep. There is still a casket with your name on it. Mm -hmm. Okay? Think about this as I was thinking this through. How about suffering? We suffer. Well, there was the woman with the issue of blood. Remember, she was bleeding, hemorrhaging out of her body for what? Was it 12 years, I believe yeah. it was? 12 years of chronic illness and hemorrhaging, and she touched the hem of Messiah's garment, and she was healed. Mark chapter 5, verse 28 and 29. She's dead. Yeah. Weakness. There was the man, remember, he had the withered hand, and Jesus simply spoke, how dare the Messiah on the Sabbath day speak to a man, and his hand grew out and was whole. 
That man died. His, that hand that was healed is now dust somewhere in Israel. Then we had, remember we learned, we learned about a dishonor, a body that's dishonoring. Remember who, the woman who was possessed of a demon and she was stooped over and she walked around hunched over for several years of her life and Jesus cast out that demon and she was able to stand up? She died. That woman died. Luke chapter 13, verse 11 and 12. Ultimately, the decay and corruption. I posted this today. This dawned on me. Lazarus died, and Jesus allowed it to happen to bring yeah. forth the glory of God. He was sick. He died. They had the funeral. They put him in the tomb. And what day was it when Jesus came to say, okay, now I want you to Four days ready. later. Four days later. And what did Mary or Martha, I can't remember who said it, say about the body when Jesus said, roll the stone away? It stinketh. It stinketh, King Jimmy. It stinketh. <laughs> Do you know what? She was correct in that statement. That body of Lazarus was putrefying and stinking. Mm -hmm. It was. Until one precise moment changed everything. When Yeshua the Messiah said, Lazarus, come forth. His body came back to life. The stench was gone, and the stone was rolled away, and he came out bound in clothes, grave clothing. The stench evaporated. It was. If you rolled that stone away 30 seconds before you examined the body of Lazarus, you'd say, that man was forsaken of God. Look at him. We don't even need to go into detail, but it's, she was right. Lord, he stinks, and he did. His body had decayed for four days, but God, but God, called him forth out of the grave. Folks, look at your bodies today. It's not going to get better. I wish I had better news. I wish I could say we're going to have a healing prayer meeting and we're all going to be healed of every bad thing in our bodies. I cannot proclaim that. But this I can proclaim. The hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The down payment of the Holy Spirit. The resurrection from the dead will occur and we will be raised and we'll never suffer these things again. So please remember, I wrote these things down. I want you to think this through. This is the nature of the human condition, our bodies of sin that are decaying. All right, now listen to this. This list. Prayer, fasting, church attendance, repentance of your sins, going on mission trips, exercise, using spiritual gifts, speaking in tongues, visualization, doing yoga, holy living, proper diet, uh, uh, intercessory prayer, etc., etc., etc. None of these things can change the state of our physical bodies. None of them. And it does not mean when you pray and God does not answer the prayer for healing that God has abandoned you and God has forsaken you or that you're in some deep, grievous sin. It is simply this is the state of our affairs. Pastors are dying of COVID. Pastors are dying. It doesn't matter. You know, Pastor Steve of, of John Howler's church just died a couple of weeks ago in his 40s, I believe. Does that mean he was a great, grievous sinner? No, it meant he was in a bodily, a mortal body. He caught a disease. He was already fighting leukemia, cancer, and he, he got COVID and died. Welcome to the fallen, broken human family. So don't let the devil lie to you. You prayed for healing. You prayed for this. Our bodies are in a state of decay. Now, thank God, I'm not saying don't pray. I'm not saying don't ask for intercessory prayer. I'm not saying don't ask for anointing because God does do miracles. But remember, it's the miracle. It's not the normal. And the devil will make you think you should have been healed. That's what God does. How come you're not healed? I'll tell you why. Because you're so wicked. That secret sin you've been doing? Yep. That's why. Okay? The only thing that's going to fix this is the resurrection, the rapture of the church. Right. It's the only thing that's going to fix it. So take your medicines, go to Steve's store, give him a lot of business, <laughs> <laughs> but realize uh -huh. at the end of the day, shameless plug, we yep. already came <laughs> We're still the temple of the Holy Ghost. We are the temple of the living God through faith in Christ. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for uh, hope, God. 
And tr help us, God, as a congregation, no longer to seek hope in facial creams, butters, ointments, uh, miracle pills, uh, beeswax, etc., etc., etc. But let us look with anticipation to the resurrection, the glorification of these yes. mortal bodies. Lord, that we would be able to endure with the proper perspective and the proper strength and empowerment to be delivered from the discouragement, the, the sorrow of these bodies with the power of living hope from a God who is faithful and who has sealed us with the Holy Spirit of promise. God, we thank you for your truth. Sometimes it's sobering. It's always correcting. But God, it is ultimately inspiring and hopeful, God, through Jesus Christ, the Messiah who died on the cross for our sins, was buried and raised from the dead that we might receive the gift of eternal life. We look forward to that day, God, when we'll be in glorified bodies, powered by the joy of the Lord, being in your presence forever, radiating your glory forever and ever and ever. Thank you, God. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.